Okay then. The basics of flight have been explained to the people who could fly, and the Daddy, how does the plane work edition of Engines of Propulsion have been explained. Tom was hoping that what came next might temper the enthusiasm for strapping engines to people, or dragons. Big people. They had too much to do, and making something like that wouldn't be in the cars for a long time. Still, he had learned enough about Dragonessa to know that laughing at things going wrong was a universal constant, so this was about to get funny. They also had a few guests who had yet to see a movie, and he was planning to show them the scary edition later when the kids went to sleep, and after food had been dealt with, of course. First off was a documentary he had found on the history of powered flight, specifically the section from before humans really figured it out, so to speak. Tom had told them no one was going to die in this one, which was mostly true. He mainly said that for the kids' sake. They weren't going to be seen any death, so they should be able to figure it out. As expected, the original expressions from his little crowd were ones of utter confusion, as they tried to figure out just what the fuck they were looking at. That quality turned to maniacal laughter, though, as things on screen fell apart, blew up, or just generally felt horribly. Tom just leaned back and let the movie do its job for now. How could they ever believe that it could work? It didn't even get moving, Richard broke out laughing. Jackie currently beyond the ability to breathe for making fun of the idiocy being displayed. They all shut up for a second when Franz Reichelt fell to his death, though. Ray especially seemed to swallow something at the sight of the faulty parachute. And that is why we test if things work in a safe way. Don't just jump and cross your fingers. Tom interjected as silence reigned. And don't worry, Ray, your parachute has been tested many times. Thanks, Ray replied, still looking rather uncomfortable. Was he okay? Fingy questioned, a few other worried faces turning to Tom. He was hurt quite badly, but he lived, Tom lied, looking reassuringly at Fengi. They have some good healers, Dakota stated, from the front row, sounding like she was speaking to herself. What the fuck is that supposed to be? Sapphire chuckled to herself as yet another contraption was brought out. This one had two wings and the same thin wood framed construction with canvas over it, as many of the other weird machines. It had two propellers, one engine, and two very brave or possibly insane humans sitting in the middle. Unlike so many of the predecessors, it did actually get to move, and there were a lot of people around to watch too. The weird old film did make it rather hard to tell what was going on exactly, but at least Jackie has stopped complaining about the lack of sounds. Seth glanced at Tom, who was staring at them rather intently, causing Seth to squint a bit. He knew something she didn't. Looking back to the screen, she gasped as the odd contraption took off, climbing very slowly and clumsily into the sky. The crazy fuckers did it! In that thing? Dakota let out in disbelief. Yup, Tom replied, leaning back, seemingly content with the response from them. The first film flight of the Wright brothers. This isn't the first flight by them, only the first that was filmed, and that thing is actually the world's first military plane, anno 1909 or just over 110 years ago. Incredible, then Costa let out. Those wings, the propellers, we could make that. But why would we want to? I mean, look at it. Rachuk interrupted, pointing at the machine slowly lumbering around in the sky. Yeah, no, that won't be useful. Let's go for the next bit. The first proper planes and just how quickly we got better. For now though, let's talk about control services and plane configurations. Tom turned off the projector and walked up to the blackboard again. Things started getting a bit more complex, but it was a fascinating subject. Saf, of course, knew everything there was to know about steering through the sky, but to look at the principles converted to a machine was definitely new. The fact they could not really do much to change their wing shape meant they basically used little flaps to steer, a crude if ingenious solution to Saf. That meant they could use stiff wings which could take more load. Tom kept going through the years, showing how the humans had mastered flight. The progress was incredible, more than one joke being cracked in a nook and a puma being older than most of this. And yet despite all this progress, the humans kept going to the limit and beyond, going higher, faster and further. Even Jarex had to concede they had him outmatched in range too within a few decades, mainly due to their much higher cruising speeds. A plane like that could make it to the capital in a few days, maybe just one if you fly through the night, then Gossard got out between her frantic note-taking. Oh, it gets better. That's a Douglas DC-3, we haven't even made it to the jet engines yet. You're gonna love that, Tom replied, as he got out some footage of a strange pointy thing with stubby wings. This is kind of cheating since he's using rockets, but this, ladies and gentlemen, is the first thing to take a human beyond the sound barrier. The Bell X-1, and that is Chuck Yeager. A real contender for craziest pilot to ever live. I like him already, Jackie replied, as the plane was carried into the sky by a much bigger plane. And off we go, Tom said with a smile, as the smaller plane was dropped. 
I tried to smoke below doubt the end of it before it sped off into the distance. Safa thought for a second that something had gone wrong, but the thing just kept going. What is that? Linkosa questioned, as the view cut to someone looking at a round screen. That's a radar. It's keeping track of the plane. It's a machine that can see very far and through clouds. How can you say that like it's, oh, we can see through clouds? That is incredible. I want five, Rachel let out with a chuckle. Tom signed a bit. Not happening, I'm afraid. Not for a long time. Yeah, he's making me the fastest person in the world first, Jackie let out, though her cheery attitude seemed to be dampened a bit when she looked at Tom, who was suddenly looking a bit tired. What about my machine gun? Jerry's questioned. Ray wasn't built in the day, so one thing at a time. Tom cut them off. Lay first, then mill. Then we can start looking at some weapons and other useful items. We need defences that will scare off an army. Then we can start having some fun. Now though, I think it's time for dinner. We will pick this up again afterward. Then we'll have a go at explaining why some things should not be made, ever. And why others need to be treated with extreme caution and respect. Most of you know what I'm on about. Then Costa had a look around at the others, Saf doing her best to convey, brace yourself, fire expression, before they set about clearing the chairs away to make room for the tables again. Well, the scare session had gone well enough. Judging by her performance the day afterward, Lynn Costa had either not been able to sleep or spent most of the night writing notes down, and even Tink hadn't as much as mentioned the nuke since. Jackie had, of course, not let the whole engine backpack thing go, not helped by Tink coming up with some ideas for how to do it over the last day or so. Jackie was quick to point out she was just excited about it. It was honestly cute to see her struggling with being so excited and not wanting to pester Tom. Jackie showing restraint. If that isn't love, I don't know what is. He chuckled to himself, as she went about explaining how she envisioned it. Tom had to admit that was a fun idea. It would not be able to run for long, but hey, it might actually be useful if they could make a fitting power plant. Testing on the power cell for the lathe had gone surprisingly smoothly. No explosions, no overheating, just clean, reliable power output. He had been worried that they would need a speed controller of some kind, but with voltage control, this fine, it simply wasn't necessary. By the end of the week, they got the motor rigged up for the first time. That was truly a special day. The first ever engine produced in this world, as Encosta so eloquently put it. That was something to be proud of. Sure, it wasn't some fire-breathing monster fit to win a war, but it was arguably more useful. Shiva had made good progress in Jackie's armour, though she had cursed quite a bit when the nook confirmed that the blood used to inscribe the enchantments was not from her mother's era. It was simply not old enough. The Smith wanted to clean out every last rune on the suit to rid it of anything unworthy, a swift reminder of just how long it would take to re-enchant it, as well as the notion that she would be wiping centuries of furlong blood and history out of it, stayed her hand. Instead, it would be re-inscribed to make sure the enchantments were strong and fit for battle. Tom had expected to have Jackie be the source of the blood, since they clearly put emphasis on you being a part of your own equipment. But to his surprise, she wanted Jarrett's. Perhaps he shouldn't have been. Dragon blood was apparently better, and if there was one thing he knew about Shiva, it was that she valued Jackie above all. Tom had seen an opportunity to make further amends with the smith on a front where they definitely agreed. He had told Shiva to hold off for just a day, taking the nook, a puma and Linkosa aside one evening, to discuss their findings of the unicorn horn. They claimed the horn to be in excellent shape despite the rather brutish method of removal. There were no cracks or other nasty surprises within it, though the cut was far from clean at the root. It had taken some convincing, but with the proposal that perhaps two sets of armour needed reinscribing, the nook was sold on the idea of using some of the horn from the break to enhance the procedure. Then Costa had at first refused, claiming such work should be carried out by masters of the craft. She did come around when Apuma found an old procedure on how to infuse the horn into the blood. It was apparently not very different from the normal procedure of reinscribing. With a little persuasion, Jerex had accepted too. It wasn't like it was a large amount of blood anyway, perhaps half a litre. The process was actually very simple. A very small amount of the horn was fired off the base where the break was and added to the blood. Then Lynn Costa, with her father's help, conducted some ritual over the mix. Then came the actual reinscribing. First, some kind of protective wards or something had to be removed. Then it was simply a matter of repainting the tiny runes with a now rather glowy concoction, and then more rituals to seal the deal. Tor tried to follow along. That last part had been about sealing the enchantments to make them harder to break or disrupt or something, as in Costa put it. Apparently that was one of the more spur-of-the-moment things she had trained in, and also why she had originally started studying enchantments. Beyond just curiosity, of course. It had taken three full days of Linkosta and Apuma's combined effort to repaint every little last rune, whatever they had done to the blood, seemingly keeping it from clotting or drying out. Jackie had been beside herself with excitement at the knowledge she was getting not only an enchanted set, 
one boosted, for a lack of a better word with the power of, as she put it, a literal fucking unicorn, this is armour fit for a queen. Tom couldn't resist making a quick quip about how it was in the perfect place then. That one certainly sat well with Jackie at least, after she confirmed she was a warrior queen, not one of those pretty ones. She have also warmed up a fair bit, that's for damn sure. And with the Smith now available for full time work on all their projects, they were soon flying. At this speed, the lathe would be done in no more than a week. Tom found himself relegated to teaching and managing what was going on just as much as actually working. His only regret was the lack of time he was spending with the kids. Nanny duties ended up mostly in the hands of the guards and huntresses for the time being. Keeping Kieran out of the workshop was, of course, near impossible, so his little assistance was along for the ride much of the time. Ray also ended up as a kind of assistant around the workshops when she was not doing cleaning or kitchen work. She did also fill in with the kids when others weren't available. All in all, she worked like a madman day in and day out to the point she could often be found asleep where she'd been working in the evening. Tom had given up trying to get her to not do that after the first few attempts, so he relented to just put her to bed if he found her. She had little skill when it came to crafting, though she did have nimble fingers and she didn't complain. She never did. When they had been working on the motor, she had burned herself rather badly on the soldering iron. Whereas Jackie would have certainly have gotten mad, Ray apologised for touching it. Tom had told her to please just stop apologising for everything. She didn't have to. At least gone to have it looked at after apologising. Tom didn't get his wish with the new bows though. Calling her and Raluf had been put to work fashioning a net for Jarek's, inspired by his mother's, judging by how effective that had been before. It would soon see their stores filled to bursting. But they would need to get cracking on those bows since they could churn them out a hell of a lot faster than the guns. So much to do and it should all have been done yesterday, Tom used to himself, as he checked off another point on the to-do list. Next up, Millhead Angel's Adjustment Bearings. Right girls, you know what to do. Ready Jarex? Sure, let's do some herding. The plan was nice and simple. The five huntresses and the two greenhorns would go out and try and force a herd over to the forest if they could find one. Once our jacks would come down on top of the deer and drop the net. Sarko and Redexi were in charge of the actual dropping. To help keep the herd in check, they had brought shields and clubs to make noise. They would keep their bows stowed unless they managed to fuck it up somehow. It had taken a while scouting watering holes before they found their quarry, but found it they did. Foe was once again paired up with Saf, the two of them getting along rather well. The Greenhorn was competitive as hell, just like Saf, though she might be a bit more reckless at times. Not Jackie levels, but still enough that you had to watch out for it. Well, here we go. Try not to break your voice roaring at them, Saf choked as they rolled into the dive. They held off on the noise for now. They didn't want the herd to break apart in panic, after all. It were like a treat, the deer bolting into the trees at full speed. They were even going in the right direction. The Huntresses followed below the canopy. Fanning out to keep the herd together, putting on a bit of noise to keep them closer together. Dakota skimming over the heaven oak to give Jax and Mark to follow. I guess this is how they do it in the inner keeps. God, it's easy, Sat mused to herself, reaffirmed in the knowledge those people couldn't hunt. Not really, at least. This was just too easy. Deer were quick, but they were faster, and they could maintain the speed for a while. The deer knew this, though, and they soon started trying to break out, putting the huntresses to work, intercepting their little attempts to drive them back. After around 10 minutes of that, the deer were exhausted to the point that they could probably have picked them off with ease anyway, but Jax had gotten his net, so they had to try it out. Saf guessed he would be rather pissed otherwise. When the deer broke out of the forest, they were honestly too tired to even notice their doom approaching from above, nor were they fast enough to run as the net came down on a good section of them. Dakota ordered that the ones not caught be allowed to run. This had not been the largest herd ever to begin with, and they had gotten most of them. The strongest animals and the lead buck were allowed to escape. The remaining deer had their necks broken, so as to not cover Jags in blood. That was the least they could do to thank him for carrying the quarry home. Well, it was a good workout, Saf stated, as they set about loading the deer. Not much of a hunt, but it was quick, Jacky replied, tying another one down. We will keep doing regular hunts. Deer gets rather boring in the long run anyway, Dakota retorted. It gives us the time for more training, though. Sounds like the people at home can use a hand too. They are doing great, though. Tom said they are going to start on the new bows for all of us now that the net is done. You are going to love them, Saf replied genuinely. They are so awesome. I can't wait for him to get started making ammo for the gun so I can actually hunt with this thing, Jacky replied, patting the revolver on her thigh. All guns for the rest of us. Think I could get one too? Folk questioned, saying like she believed that probably wouldn't happen. They had held a little demonstration for the new faces as well. Foe was definitely sold too, as was Bo for that matter. I have no clue. 
Jackie, has he said anything about how long they take to make? Dakota questioned. All eyes turning to Jackie expectantly. Um, well, there are definitely many kinds, so I'm guessing it depends. I can ask him if you want. Just don't make it sound like we're impatient. I think Wachuk has that one covered. He must have asked by now. He mostly talks about traps and other things. He really liked the idea of the anti-corruption mine, Jackie replied. In what was unmistakably her attempt at sounding like Tom, it was not very successful. A what? Zyka questioned, from where she was busy packing Jarex's net again. It goes boom if there is anything corrupt in it by. Sounds real handy. And Costa looked like she wanted to die at the thought of having to make the triggers. Jackie replied with a laugh. Well, she's going to have to pull her weight for once then. All those years with her nose in the books need to amount to something. Dakota replied plainly. Be nice now, Essie interrupted, looking rather pointedly at Dakota. She's worked wonders on your mother's armour. I'm kidding. I can never do that, Dakota replied, a hint of annoyance creeping into her voice. She can't shoot for shit, though. Might be able to with a shotgun, Jackie interrupted with a chuckle. Don't do a heron, but that's a weapon for those who don't know what they are doing. Why did he give you the revolver, then? Sapphire joked cockily. Jackie seemed not appreciating that one. Maybe I should not ask him what you should use. I mean... A rifle would be sweet, I guess. Don't think I could steer the shot, though. That would be a bit of a bummer. She'd gotten rather used to being able to just fire and let her magic do the work, but she hadn't seen Tom shoot. She could not even see the shot when he fired. So, do I know what I'm doing with this thing? Jackie questioned, looking very smug. Sav looked at Jackie with an annoyed smile. Jackalo Furlong, the finest dragonette... revolver girl? What do you even call that? Fuck. I need to ask that, too. Gunwoman? Fengi tried. Jackie scratching the back of her neck a little. The hunts had apparently been going very well. Jackie and Saf were around to help out intermittently now, though they were spending a lot of time training. Saf with the new recruits and Jackie with her new armour. Essie and Fengi having more time with the kids had also freed Ray up a little, though it was seen the only effect was that everything was now even cleaner around the keep. Rachuk and Nanook were taking Jacklo through quite the training regime. Shiva had explained that Jackie needed to pretty much learn to fight again from scratch. She was trained as a flying archer who had a self-learned affinity for the Warhammer in close combat. Halbers, too, apparently. Something about little Jackie thinking they were just the coolest. Now, though, she was expected to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with just about the nastiest things the world had to offer and not back off. The no fear part had come naturally, but the whole using your armor part had been hard for her to grasp. It didn't help she had never done much sword fighting, nor did she seem cut out for it. They didn't have an enchanted shield for her either, which resulted in her being equipped with a halberd for the time being, which made her very happy. Jackie's revolver had gotten a custom holster made that fit on the back side of her thigh to keep it safe. Then she could switch the revolver, drawing one of the armor's holdout daggers if needed. The only thing she lacked was a place with grenades, but they would figure that out at some point. She looked so fucking badass walking into the spine ring when Tom had gone down to watch a few rounds one day. The illusion was sadly broken when Wachuk had a go at her. She was quick, but he was faster, and when she struck, he definitely blocked or dodged. Jackie got him one good hit, which had sent him flying. He got her in return, though, sneaking inside her defences, flying as close to her as he could get away with. Headbutt, Jackie! Knock his ass out! Tom shouted at her, as she struggled to backpedal to make use of her longer weapon. She reversed direction, stepping forward, trying to sweep with Chuck's legs as she went for a shove. He saw it coming, though, making a quick hop backward before bringing the sword up under her chin, Jackie freezing in place. I think I can pierce that part, Chuck went, holding the blade against the leather backed mouth for just a second. You need to keep him away from you. And if he gets that close, you crush him, the nook shouted at Jackie. He's smaller and weaker, so use it. Thanks, Mum, Rachuk replied sarcastically, taking up a stance for another round. Now remember, quick on your feet. I'm going to try to sweep them. He didn't get his chance, as he once again moved in close, trying to go for Jackie's legs. She dropped the halberd and kicked forwards. Jackie embraced the confused Rachuk, who looked almost like he was going to ask why she did that. The dagger Jackie had retrieved from the armor's back soon got his attention, though, as she pushed it into his back, just enough to prove the point. Jackalope, those aren't dulled! The nook shouted out. Jackie let go. Sorry, but I have to learn how to use them. Yeah, Tom was not quite convinced she was, in fact, sorry. But it looked like she had been careful, at least. It's fine, Mum. It's all in good spirit. Rachel dismissed his mother. The nook seemingly not quite convinced. Deciding it was her turn now, she put on her helmet and drew her enchanted sword. If you want a proper fight, I'll give you one. Yield or first blood? Done. I'm guessing no gun? Jackie questioned sarcastically, picking up her own nice and sharp halberd from the weapons rack, sheathing the dagger. Tom knew her well enough to hear that she was sounding nervous. He was curious, though. He had not seen the Nook fight apart from getting her ass kicked in the armory way back. Jackie was a touch winded already, which really didn't help her odds. 
It wasn't that Tom didn't believe in her. It was just that, well, yeah, no. She was likely about to get her ass kicked by a hundred-year-old grandma who actually knew what she was doing. Jackie did put up a valiant defense, managing a fair few blocks and even getting Nanook to backpedal a bit. Rachel was chuckling as he came up beside Tom. She might be getting on a little, but she knows what she is doing. Don't know. Looks like Jackie is doing well, Tom replied, as Jackie forced Nanook to duck with a wide swing. Nah, Mom's playing with her. Any second now. Tom was a touch sceptical, but as Nanook's blade phased through one of Jackie's blocks, he remembered that, yeah, only one combatant was fighting with an enchanted weapon here. That was hardly fair in his mind. From there it happened all too quickly. The Nook stepped forward, tripping Jackie with her tail, a move Tom hadn't really thought about before, sending Jackie sprawled onto her back. She was reaching for one of her daggers when the Nook used a single wind beat and a jump to land on top of Jackie, pinning down both her arms with her claw feet. Well, shit, Tom concluded, as Rachel looked at him, likely going to say, I told you so, or something of that nature. Jackie, though, was seemingly not done yet. As the Nook leveled her blade at Jackie's throat, the hundreds used her tail, combined with the Nook holding down her arms, to land a powerful kick on the Nook's back, sending her flying forward to a surprise yelp. Tom and Rachug led her to joint, ooh, as the Nook face planted in the dirt. Jackie was first on her feet, the Nook only getting up onto all fours as Jackie raised the halberd for a swing. The Nook rolled out of the way before getting to her feet, bringing up her blade. Fine! Come on then! The Nook shouted at Jackie, who replied with a powerful swing. The Nook stepped back out of Jackie's swing before lunging forwards. Jackie throwing up a block with the half of the halberd. The Nook simply faced her blade through it, bringing up the blade up onto Jackie's armpit and going for a stab. It was clear she was hesitant, not wanting to hurt Jackie too badly. The enchanted blade didn't pierce as the newly inscribed runes on the armor burned bright for a split second. Damn, okay, Rachel let out. Tom nodding sagely. That was exactly what he had been hoping for. Shiva had explained that Nanook's armor, while amazing, was reliant on the natural strength of Mithril scales and chain to safeguard the vulnerable parts. It was also of slightly lighter construction to allow her more freedom of movement. Jackie's new armor, on the other hand, took special care to reinforce the weak points, using both enchantments and heavier mail than usual to let the user focus on a fence. The true furlong way. It made it bulkier, but that fit Jackie just fine. The Nook paid for her hesitance, and surprised at the lack of penetration, with a strike to the back of the head with the half of Jackie's halberd. To Tom's surprise, it didn't seem to do much, the force of the blow likely being mostly eaten up by the enchantments. That had been another long explanation on how they managed to do away with much of the padding to lighten up the armour, but right now it was clear both of the women were furious. The Nook pulled back, taking a full swing from Jackie on her shield, which, unlike with Chooks, was enchanted. The hit still threw her off balance, but the magic was likely the difference between that and sending her flying out of the ring. Jackie used the time brought to bring down the halberd from above, with enough force to kill the Nook in a single hit, had the lady not been inside that masterpiece of metalwork. The Nook caught the hit on her shield, sending her to one knee. The more experienced fighter was starting to show her age, as Jackie was no longer the only one showing signs of fatigue. Jackie, though, had been burning magic for those swings, and it showed. She was too slow to land a third hit on the Nook, who definitely dodged the incoming swing, Jackie having overcommitted to it. That became her final mistake, as the Nook made her way around Jackie's side, kicking her in the back of the knee. The kick sent Jackie off balance, forcing her to one knee, leaning on the halberd. The Nook jumped onto Jackie's back, lashing her with claw and talon, taking out her own dagger. It was a sharp needle-like weapon, clearly meant to pierce things, the lady holding her to Jackie's neck. Yield! The Nook shouted. Jackie freezing in place, seemingly thinking for a second. The lady reaffirmed her threat by pushing the dagger a bit harder. Yield! With a strange sigh, Jackie dropped the halberd in defeat. A hundred years and going strong, Richard joked, giving Tom the playable hit to the shoulder. We will make one hell of a warrior out of you yet, the Nook went, holding out her hand to Jackie after she got off. We have to, no way a choker's gonna cut it, Jackie replied, taking off the helmet before shaking the Nook's hand with a smile. Tom guessed was at least a little forced. Hey, what was that for? Richard protested, Tom having a slight chuckle at the captain's expense. <laughs>